Let's uh, give a warm Fort Wayne welcome to Nick, Danielle, and Mike from the 1517 Fund. All right. What a good Fort Wayne welcome. Um, so I know many of you, and there's also lots of you that I don't know. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on myself um, and uh, uh, fill in some context. Side. Got it? Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm a Fort Wayne native. So I, I was born and raised here in Fort Wayne, um, grew up here, um, went, to, uh, went to school here, graduated from Southside High School, um, always had a strong interest in community development. Um, so I think back when I was 14 years old, I started working at the Downtown Improvement District here, um, spent some time working for the Regional Partnership. Um, then eventually started my own nonprofit that was um, examining how um, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems grow and develop in uh, small and mid-sized cities uh, throughout the country called the 12 Cities Project. And um, uh, during that journey, I uh, had started that uh, shortly after I graduated from Southside High School and was kind of at this fork in the road where um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to take a traditional path and go to college and get a degree um, or if I wanted to take kind of an alternative path and um, sort of take my, my learning on the road. And so I, I chose the latter um, and that was kind of a, a difficult decision for a lot of reasons. It's, it's um, obviously not easy to, to chart your own path um, and to uh, kind of um, break away from the pack. but. Um, uh, Dan Swartz, many of you know Dan Swartz, and by the way, um, can we have a quick round of applause for Dan for uh, to thank him? Uh, to thank him for opening up uh, Wunderkammer for this discussion tonight. Dan has hosted many wonderful discussions here over the years, um, and we're thankful to him for that. Um, but Dan had, had brought to my attention, uh, when we were both actually working, I think, at the Downtown Improvement District together or in conversation late one night, he said, you know, there's, there's this crazy guy out in San Francisco named Peter Thiel, um, and he co-founded PayPal. He was the first investor in Facebook. You really, you, you need to know who he is. You need to, to research him. Um, this was around 2010. He said he just announced this uh, fellowship program where he's giving uh, 20 $100,000 grants um, to individuals under 20 years old each year who are um, uh, working on really interesting projects and part of the hook on that is that they have to drop out or stop out of college for those two years that they become a Teal Fellow. And, um, and he said, you know, Nick, this is, this is perfect for you. you. You need to connect with these people. You need to apply. Um, you need to put yourself out there. And I didn't take his advice the first year. I, I let the, the application deadline go and um, looked at it, I think, January 3rd. And, and it's like, ah, I'm, I'm three days too late. Um, next year rolls around, Dan keeps hounding me, Nick, you really you need to, to apply um, to the Teal Fellowship and, and get to know these people. They're perfect for you. And um, so I did apply in the second year. Um, made it through a couple of the selection rounds, um, and uh, what I what I didn't know at the time is when I was filling that application out, um, these two were on the other end of that that application. Um, they were the ones looking at the applications and helping to make selections, and um, so I made it through a few rounds before I get this uh, this note from Danielle, um, kindly rejecting me, um, telling me I was not going to be a Teal Fellow. Um, but later on, she hired me. Um, so <laughs> it worked out in, in, in lots of ways. And um, uh, I've gotten to know Danielle and Mike um, over the years. Um, we've been working together for about seven years now. Um, as Fred mentioned twice, uh, first at the TL Foundation, um, they brought me on to help with community operations there. Um, and now with uh, 1517 Fund. Um, and I get to brag about them. Um, I, from a third party perspective, you're wearing my, my Fort Wayne hat and my Nick Arnett hat, not my 1517 hat. Um, they're two of, of the best individuals that I've ever had the, the pleasure of, of knowing and working with. Um, so I've always wanted to bring them to Fort Wayne. The stars aligned with uh, Design Week going on this week. Um, Danielle had a panel earlier today with uh, Marilyn Marin Townsend that um, was fantastic talking about venture capital. And um, so Dan and I thought we would um, try to pull together a conversation, the Farnsworth Fund. Um, and Elevate Ventures Northeast Indiana um, stepped in to co-sponsor tonight. Um, and we're excited to dive into lots of questions about 
um, the crazy, wacky stories that you both have. So um, I think a good place to start, um, let me pull up my questions here, but I, I always love to start from the beginning um, because the two of you have really interesting origin stories. Um, I don't think either of you ever thought you would be working for Peter Thiel. I don't think either of you ever thought that you would be working in venture capital. Um, so let's hear a, a little bit about your own kind of non-traditional path into the, the crazy world of venture capital, whoever wants to start. Sure, well first, um, Dan over there, we owe you dinner, at least a few of them. Um, since we worked with Nick so long, I had no idea that you were on the end of influencing him to apply. And we had heard that from a lot of people, especially in the first couple of years of, oh, someone told me about the Teal Fellowship and that's why I applied. So, so dinner on us many times. Um, but um, let's see. So my background is in an alternative education. I started a tutoring company back in 2002. And by happenstance, I ended up working with homeschooled students. Um, these students were very vivacious. When I would go over a student's house who was in public school or private school, I was there to help um, and to help a situation that no one was really having fun with. It was usually to help with homework that no one wanted to do. Oftentimes students were behind. Um, so I'd go over and I'd help, but it would be you know, sort of like putting a, a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, uh, to put it mildly. But when I started working with homeschooled students, they were very lively. I'd go over, can you stay for three hours today? Can you work with the seven-year-old today, the 15-year-old, and our three-year-old today? Sure, no problem. Like, let's do it. Um, one thing that's uh, synonymous with venture capital is everything sort of on the seat of your pants when you're a tutor, uh, and it's the same thing in our line of work. So uh, it actually served me quite well. But I ended up starting a charter school from there that was based on homeschooling principles. Uh, it has been in existence for 10 years. I founded the school for the first two years, ran the school for two years after that, and have been on the board ever since. Um, and then from there, I'm just making a long story short, ended up coming up to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so born and raised in Boston, went to San Diego to start my tutoring business, went to San Francisco thereafter, um, and got this crazy phone call one day from a friend of mine who worked at the Teal Foundation, this woman, Lindy, and she says, hey, the foundation has lost their minds, you have to get over here. I was like, whoa, this is an interesting phone call. Um, the Teal Fellowship had launched like publicly. It was on Facebook. It was in the media. It was all over the place. But I had assumed that because it had launched, it meant that there was a full program, that they'd have a full staff and things like that. Um, that was not the case. I'll have, I'll have Mike take the story from, from there on the fellowship side. Um, so bookmark that. But after working with the Teal Foundation and the Teal Fellowship for five years, Michael and I saw the opportunity to expand our work and not just work with young people individually, but to work with their companies uh, by, inve uh, by investing uh, larger dollar amounts into companies. We typically write a 250K check. Um, so, so we left our operational roles. We actually we went to Peter. We had breakfast at his house. Peter never does agendas when he has meetings, and so we thought we would surprise him when we were going to leave our operational role, so we didn't tell him what we want to talk about. And we sat down at breakfast. We said, Peter, you know, we, we'd like to leave our operational roles at the Teal Foundation to start this venture capital fund. And he says, great, let's do it. And we're like, okay, great, all right, awesome. Um, he committed to being an anchor uh, investor that day. Um, my smile was so big I had to cover my mouth. I was like, I, I don't want him to know how happy I am right now, I don't know. Um, but that's a very short version of, uh, yeah, how I went from being a tutor uh, to working in startup investing. Uh, part, part of the pitch, though, was that we had been running this program, the Teal Fellowship, which was a grant-making program for, uh, for five years. And uh, we gave $100,000 to 20, uh, 20. You had to be 19 or under to apply. And uh, we gave out 20 of those a year. And over five years, what we had seen was a number of companies start. Not everyone worked on that. Some people did uh, nonprofit work. Other people did some quirky scientific research. But we had something like uh, 37 companies that had come out of 84 fellows at the time or about and of those, and this is 2015, uh, of those it's like the top seven were somewhere in, in aggregate worth around like 600 million in market cap. So that's a, that, that was the pitch then. Uh, we uh, met, you know, we raised money from Peter but then we hit the road, and we and we started learning about uh, 
this weird ecosystem of investors who invest in investors who invest in companies, which was like something wholly new to us. And that took us to strange places. We've met, uh, we've met Chinese communists. We've met libertarians from Guatemala. We've met uh, German princesses and Norwegian shipping magnates. <laughs> uh, and, and yet we would tell them, we'd, we'd, we'd tell them the pitch that we want to invest in uh, younger, overlooked entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, we saw the success in our own program, and then there was just this broader trend in, in Silicon Valley lore, right, is Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg all started their companies as dropouts probably around the age of 20, 21. Those companies are now worth $1.7 tr in market cap. They're some of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, some, you know, they're not as famous as those companies, but they're all worth more than a, a, a billion dollars. Companies like Dropbox, uh, Snapchat, uh, Oculus Rift was bought by Facebook. Those are all billion dollar companies started by people between the age of 18 and 23. Uh, so Silicon Valley is known to have this youth obsession, but we, we want to uh, really take it seriously. We want to look in regions and cities outside of the Bay Area that are, that are often overlooked because we know that talent can come from anywhere. I love the Farnsworth name because it harkens back to an era when we were a nation of inventors and explorers. And uh, part of the, the Teal Fellowship was, was meant to try to help reignite that. And I think with 1517, we're trying to do that do as well. And we use our $1,000 grants we give out. We, we kick out these little grants to people turn uh, ideas into prototypes and, and help them get started. And it's all, all in that spirit. So I have to say, I am humble. Thank you. I can't, what's her name? The, uh, the singer who, uh, Addison. Well, thank you. I, I am very, uh, I, I feel great humility that y you all are, are taking our idea, idea to a whole new level. So actually, Mike, keep the mic. Because um, I still want to go over your origin story. Uh, oh, okay. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you what, bu away from what me business do, so Danielle is a uh, school principal, uh, f school founder. I am a uh, failed academic. I was working on a PhD in philosophy at Oxford University. I thought I would uh, change the world by thinking about deep questions of, you know, what is justice and <laughs> how do we uh, create a, a, a more just society. I, I, I decided I was just going to, in the best case scenario, maybe I'd add, uh, decimal place to someone's already existing view, and and I couldn't imagine, uh, you know, I, I was giving a, I, I had a paper at a conference, and I'm giving this talk, and 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 the room had five people, and I don't, I didn't convince them of anything, and I felt a visceral reaction, thinking, oh my, I can't do this when I'm, when I'm 60. So I, I've come a long way. I don't know, maybe we have 30 people in this room, and you're <laughs> you're listening to me. You've already taken one of our ideas. I'm I, I'm doing. Really uh, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, studying philosophy to, to this, I, my first job uh, after dropping out was as a journalist. I worked for MIT. They have a magazine called Technology Review. I wrote lots of stories across different technologies, and, and one of them was uh, a story on PayPal, actually, on uh, Max Levchin, the, the CTO. And uh, I, I asked Max, uh, it, w it had been five years since uh, eBay had bought PayPal for 1.5 billion. Uh, I asked Max, you know, would he tell his younger self any do anything different? And he said, uh, after after the company was sold, he took a year off. He traveled the world. He lived on a beach, and then he said it was the worst year of his life. And so I was on the phone, and I just remember thinking, geez, who is this guy? Uh, and I said, so what do, what do you mean by that? And he said, oh, I was consuming. I wasn't producing anything, and all my friends were creating these great companies. Who are your friends? Uh, and, and then that was the first time I ever heard of what's known as the PayPal Mafia. Uh, so these uh, guys who were involved with PayPal, uh, went, as soon as the company was sold to eBay, they all went off and, had, and, and basically created uh, the generation of, of great internet companies in the 2000s. So uh, Elon Musk is, is one of the co-founders. In 2006, seven, when I discovered this, I, I, I discovered this man who's creating rocket ships and electric cars, and I thought, who, this is unbelievable. Um, Reid Hoffman founded LinkedIn. Steve Chen founded YouTube. 
uh, just tremendous creativity from that group. And that's when I first came across Peter Thiel. And, I, I, and he was managing a hedge fund. He had done the, the Facebook investment, but uh, just seemed like a really interesting thinker. And so I, I, I tried, I, I sent an email in <laughs> saying I was interested in working for him. No one responded. And it wasn't until uh, Danielle invited me on her boat at a water festival and asked me to grill a steak that I, that I also met someone who worked. <laughs> I also met someone who worked for Peter. And, and, and uh, you know, sorry, this is carrying on. But I, I ended up getting a job. I show up, to, I was hired to work as a researcher on the hedge fund. Uh, and I show up to work the first day, and, and this coworker says, hey, we had this idea on a plane last night. We're going to pay people to leave school. I said, great. He said, yeah, it's the anti road scholarship. We hate road Scholars. And I was like, I hate them too. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Uh, so and I hope there aren't any road Scholars in here. Um, but uh, but that, that was the general thought. And then uh, Peter had an a appearance that day at TechCrunch Disrupt, this big Silicon Valley tech conference. And... He, uh, he announced this fellowship program that day as if he had been thinking about it for six months. It had been conceived the night before. It was born in 12 hours. And then uh, we hired Danielle to save us a week later. <laughs> and I guess one thing I, I did want to just say before we go to the next question is one thing that for me is a unifying theme because sometimes people will say like, well, how did you go from being an educator to being an investor? Is that that homeschooling philosophy of how you work with people and how you treat individuals in that has really been embedded in everything we do. Like I conceive of the fellowship and we all do as just an older homeschool program. Uh, and it's exactly the same with our investment fund where it's like project-based learning at its absolute finest because reality is the best teacher. Okay, so I, I, I've got lots of questions that I want to ask about 1517, and, and you both have fascinating stories from just the last three years alone, but I, I do want to go back to the Teal Fellowship a little bit, and I'm curious to hear, you know, what was it like having to build such a, a publicly um, controversial program from the, from the ground up, um, and what was it like working with someone like, like Peter Teal? That's a great question. Um, I guess, you know, I'll speak for myself. Um, I mean, it was very invigorating to be able to work at a foundation that had the resources to be able to say, hey, okay, we want to try something crazy. We can do it. Not only um, can we, can we, you know, do it within that foundation, but get global recognition for the work that we were doing was really incredible. Um, I, I really loved that the program had that global reach. Um, I remember when the program launched uh, well, we, we started it in 2010, but the first set of Teal Fellows were not announced until, I think it was June of 2011. We had a media team we worked with, and the media team assured us that at most we would get two weeks of press about this, and then it would die out, and you know we would just quietly run our little program from there. Um, the fellowship launches, the 20 people's names, actually it was 24, we couldn't stop ourselves at 20, so we picked 24 people the first year. Their names go up in lights. Um, we put out a press release, and for six weeks thereafter, um, it was just nonstop. People wanted to talk about it. Um, Peter had coined the term the education bubble. Now people talk about the education bubble just as a term, like they don't even, uh, you know, ascribe Peter to that anymore. Our whole goal with the program was to really just get people to think about college and the pros and cons. And I love that now discussions and families happen and discussions on the news happen talking about college and, and higher ed. And Peter isn't even mentioned anymore, which I actually think is really wonderful because it means it's just part of the whole conversation here. Um, so that part was really, really wonderful. On the other hand, it's very difficult, at least for me, when you're working with someone who is a big figurehead. Um, because anything that we do there if anyone doesn't like it or if a Teal Fellow did something that somebody didn't like and it got reported on, it's like, Peter's terrible. He's the worst person ever. This program shouldn't exist. Like, just slander, slander, slander. So that, that part can be very, very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, the, the net positive just far outweighed the negatives. But, you know, we did have to think about, hey, what's going to happen for someone tomorrow? Is someone going to report on it? How are we going to handle this? Because we're responsible for for someone's reputation. So I guess that's what I'll say about it. Uh, maybe some general comments are just that Peter is just r tremendously brilliant. One of the things I admire is he has a very flat uh, organization in, in the sense that any, any employee could walk into his office 
you know, scheduling time and pitch an idea, and he and he would be willing to fund it. Um, it's almost like if you're an employee with, employee with him too long, it's like you're a bad one because you it's it shows you <laughs> didn't pitch him an idea uh, in enough time, um, and and so that's that that's remarkable. I think you know in the last few years he, he, he the press portrays him as this sort of calculating rational person who uh, doesn't have any feelings and is a bit of a robot, and, and, and the truth is, is the inverse. He's a tremendously uh, intuitive thinker who, who bases a lot of decisions on pattern recognition, and, uh, and he does it quite quickly. Um, you know, he, he, he is funny, too. It's like, that's the other thing, he's very funny, even in, like, moments where uh, you uh, might not expect it. I was talking to him, so the very controversial thing was the... Uh, uh, Gawker, where he, he uh, financed Hulk Hogan's lawsuit against Gawker, um, and, and he asked me, he said, oh, what do you think of the, the way the press portrayed that? And I said, well, you know, what's kind of interesting to me is, uh, you know, they always, everyone just loves portraying you as this person who, who sees six moves ahead and is operating from the shadows, and he says, but I was. <laughs> um, so with the with the Teal Fellowship, though, yeah, it was hard. It's like some things take time. Uh, community, it takes years, and then even technologies to develop. And I feel as though the national press uh, wasn't giving us the time that it takes to, to nurture things uh, in order to really show how powerful they could be. And and so we would see these stories that, you know, in like the third year of the program, they're, they're, they're claiming no one invented anything important out of the Teal Fellowship. Um, and, and, you know, it just took time. I kept telling people to wait and see. Um, and, and so, you know, one of these stories is, that's incredible to me now, it's, it's like, uh, you know, we met this young, wiry uh, Russian immigrant in, in Canada. He was at the University of Waterloo. We went to uh, give a talk on the Teal Fellowship. It was like four people in a cinder block uh, industrial <laughs> lecture hall with fluorescent lighting. And uh, this guy had some thoughts about Bitcoin. He was uh, editor of Bitcoin Magazine, uh, but he had written a white paper where he was describing how the technology that, under, that powers Bitcoin, the blockchain, uh, that this could be repurposed for, for other applications. So not, like currency is just one. Uh, you could do incredible other things with digital assets, meaning you could do uh, digital contracts, you could have digital escrow, you know, these types of things that the blockchain allows. Uh, this young man, Vitalik Buterin, uh, explained and then wrote a paper about the technology that could do it. And uh, we gave him a grant, uh, a fellowship, and uh, helped him launch Ethereum, which I don't know, you know how many people here have heard of, uh, of that cryptocurrency, but we, we helped him uh, through the Teal Fellowship with that. And I have this, I have this amazing Facebook post where I... Uh, uh, before the pre-sale of Ether, I'm trying to get people to buy it, and I and I and I'm telling everyone, hey, you gotta you gotta buy these things, and uh, and then you know when it came down to it, I didn't buy any. <laughs> um, uh, the Ethereum has a market cap today of about seventy billion dollars. Um, my if, uh, a friend of mine who met Vitalik because he came to one of our events, he 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 invested five hundred dollars and he cashed it out for four hundred thousand this year. Uh, he did not buy me a drink. <laughs> Danielle still gets upset about that. Uh, so that that we met him in 2013, and 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 the full flowering of Ethereum took a good five years. Uh, so it takes some time, uh, and there's this surreal quality where you see something like that grow. It's, it, it can be quite incredible. And if I can butt in there for a second. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the experience of a Teal Fellow might be like? I mean, it, this isn't just a, a prize that's given to them and then completely hands off. It, it's actually quite a, a hands-on program. I mean, there's there's lots of, of community and mentorship that's wrapped around it mm -hmm. um, and lots of different opportunities for them to engage um, with the two of you and, and with their peers. Yeah, absolutely. So we knew when the Teal Fellowship was launching, we needed it to be um, more of an internal program of the Teal Foundation. It was um, sort of the first operational program within the foundation. Usually before that, the foundation would write checks to uh, external programs and go from there. 
Um, but especially with my background, I was like, we're not just going to write 100K checks to an 18-year-old and send them out for two years and hope for the best. <laughs> like, um, so um, so we, need, we knew that we needed to build uh, a number of different things. Community was a big one, and community not only um, of, of the Teal Fellows themselves, but also people who could mentor and help guide them. We also knew that programmatic aspects would be important, yet at the same time, we did not want to emulate school. Um, so I always describe things as a buffet table where we have a lot of different options for people. Like I think every month we would have different workshops that would happen in San Francisco. Um, Teal Fellows were not restricted on where they lived, so they could be anywhere in the world. Vitalik was all over the place all the time, so we didn't expect him to be showing up to a workshop. Um, but we would offer workshops and other programming during the month, um, and we thought of it like a buffet table. So hey, if this workshop is important to you, like a, we had a negotiations workshop with an excellent negotiator, Holly Schroth, who's from the Haas School of Business. She would come in um, every, every year or so and do some great programming with us. And people would come, and they would take that information uh, and then and go out from there. And one of the things that we learned, especially with working with millennials and Gen Z, is that they want um, when the house is lightly on fire information. Um, people don't necessarily think ahead a whole bunch of like, oh, at some point I'm really going to need to know um, this particular skill. They want to know it when it's relevant. Um, so often people would come to our workshops and say, yeah, like this month I'm starting to do partnerships with people, so negotiation is really important for me. Um, or one of our mentors, Augie Rakow, who's a lawyer, would come in and talk about all the different types of um, investable mechanisms between safes and convertible notes and how do you raise a round and things like that. Um, one of the big parts were things like just community, having a, a group of young people who were doing a similar thing when they got in a room with other young people. The first question wasn't where do you go to college or you know, it was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you spending your time on? Um, and that was really refreshing for people to, to be in a community of people who really understood that they were working on something you know, outside of school, outside of the mainstream, and that that was just as important, if not more important, than going out and getting a degree. Um, so that was really important to people. And then the last part was just some structural pieces. Like, we would have reviews with TL Fellows every two to three months, basically, where we'd sit down at a high level to talk about how's it going, you know, how's your project, how can we help. Um, we would often have mentors attend those review sessions so they could also give feedback on how they thought things were going. Um, We'd even have other TL fellows sometimes sit on, on those. So it was really collaborative meetings. And actually, we still do those with 1517. We sit down with our companies and check in on how they're doing it at a high level. And our companies have our cell phone numbers. Um, they always know they can reach us. The TL fellows were the same. They always knew they could reach out and you know say, hey, the house is actually on fire. It's 2 in the morning. I need some help. Many times when we would have retreats, I would get phone calls from TL fellows at 2 in the morning. I missed my flight. My flight you know, got delayed in this way. I don't know where to stay. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I was like, really? Oh, okay, it's three in the morning. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll take care of this, but that's what we did. So it's so a lot of different programming. So, so that was one chapter of your life, the Teal Fellowship. A long one. <laughs> a long one. And so the two of you ran the Teal Fellowship um, for the first five years, up through year five of the program. And, um, and then you hit this, uh, this, if I can call it an intersection or a fork in the road where you realized, um, I think the, the way you described it this morning is, is realized, um, you know, if you step away from your operational roles at the TL Fellowship, Peter is, is going to find someone else to, to fill those shoes. Um, but there is a potential for a much greater impact um, and, and the potential to scale the impact that you were having um, working with young founders um, by launching a fund of your own. Um, so, um, and, and to Mike's point too, I, I don't uh, want this to be lost in the conversation. The, the patience piece I think is really important. Um, and as a community and as a region, I think that's something that um, we really need to keep in mind when uh, we're talking about working with entrepreneurs um, of any stage. And, and Danielle um, and Marilyn both really drove this point home when talking about the Farnsworth Fund earlier today. Um, you're not gonna see results overnight. Um, you're not going to see results often in, in six months. It's sometimes going to take years, especially when you're working with um, companies that are, are in a very early stage. Um, but at that fifth year of the fellowship, you started to see some of those exciting results and, and started to see some of the fruits of your labor, um, which presented a, a really exciting opportunity. So, um, 
So what are you doing now? What's what's 1570? I have to act like I don't know any of this. I mean, I, it just pays my bills. But um, <laughs> what? so what is 1517? Um, what's the origin story there? Um, give us a high-level overview. And also, what? Yeah. where did the name come from? Yeah. Uh, so we had this idea that we'd, we'd start making investments uh, as opposed to grants. And uh, we didn't know exactly what to call it. Um, a buddy of mine had this idea. There's this Indian mathematician, and he, and he came from India, so this guy was a, a hero to him, uh, uh, Ramanujan. And, and so in the early 20th century, this Indian mathematician came from nowhere. He, was, he basically uh, worked on a farm and found a mathematics textbook and taught himself uh, enough math to get to the frontier in the field, and then he started inventing uh, and discovering proofs. Um, and he wrote to three Cambridge or five Cambridge professors, and, and only one responded. And then he went to Cambridge and, and studied there, and, and had a very, uh, very short career, and, but it was productive. Uh, really brilliant mind, but sadly he was dying. And, and, and this professor who had answered his original letter came to visit him. And for want of anything else to talk about, this professor said, uh, I had the most boring cab number. Uh, when, on the way here, and, and Ramanujan said, well, what was it? He says, oh, it was, it was cab 1729. And Ramanujan says, that's not a boring number. That's the lowest number that is the sum of two cubes in two different ways. <laughs> and so it's like, what? He like did that on the fly. So uh, we had this idea of 17, 1729 was like something that was in my mind. And I, I, I had made a sweatshirt, and everyone just kept asking me, what is 1729? And really, that was about finding talent in unlikely places. That was about a mathematician who was found in the, in the farms of India. And uh, we were thinking, you know, could we find anyone in the world? Um, so we were, like, we were thinking about doing the, the fund. I was thinking, maybe there's a number. Um, so the, the fellowship had this, this view that, you know, college isn't the only path to success that uh, there are fulfilling, rewarding careers uh, outside of that, that there's a, a renegade path or exciting one that you didn't have to take debt uh, to, under, you know, to embark on. And, uh, and it dawned on us that there was this analogy, this religious analogy. So uh, in the 16th century, the Catholic Church had grown very corrupt. Uh, I was born Catholic, but I can say <laughs> that the church was was doing some bad things back then because what they they were they were financing the construction of great cathedrals by uh, selling a piece of paper. It was called an indulgence, and what it did is it would it would save your soul. Uh, you just fork over some cash, you get a piece of paper, you're good to go. You're in heaven. Um, you know th th this angered a few people, and uh, one one person in particular was Martin Luther who famously nailed his 95 theses, which are 95 arguments against the sale of this piece of paper. Uh, he nailed that to a church door in 1517. Um, so our analogy is that uh, back then there was this powerful institution that was selling a piece of paper, telling people it was the only way they could save their souls. And likewise now, there's a powerful institution. It's selling a piece of paper. It's called a diploma, and they're telling you it's the only way you can save your soul. But it was, you know, BS then, and it's BS now. <laughs> uh, and, and so I pitched that to Danielle and Peter, and they're like, hey, yeah, I kind of like that. Um, I, I wore a T-shirt to a hackathon in UC, at UCLA. There were 1,000 people there. Oh, okay, that's true. I skipped a step where we're sitting not knowing uh, what to do, and Danielle's like, make a T-shirt and go to the hackathon. <laughs> So, so the whole thing was is that we wanted to sort of like a, any good startup founder, you want to test your ideas before you decide to go and like get domain names and register things and all this. And um, so we're actually we we're sitting on the floor of Michael's apartment. We weren't even at the foundation. And uh, we're thinking about, well, how could we test this? How could we test this? The next weekend or two weekends later, uh, Michael was slated to go to a hackathon in Los Angeles called LA Hacks. It's a thousand young people there. We were going on the TL Foundation's dime at the time, but we're like, well, Peter likes people who are a little squirrely. Let's be a little squirrely. Let's print up two t-shirts that say 1517 on them, just a black t-shirt, white numbers. And, you know, let's spend, 
I think it was $35 for two t-shirts on Zazzle, um, and, uh, and print them and go, and... And yet I got on stage, uh, they thought I was there on behalf of the Teal Foundation, I mean that's how we paid to get in the event, but I, I, I wore this, this t-shirt uh, pretending to be a fund that didn't yet exist, and, yeah, and I pitched that. Um, and I got, I got applause like that, like there was, you know, a couple people and, uh, it seemed to work. Uh, so that was, a, that was fun. So we, we, you know, decided to go with that. To this day, people still, if we wear these numbers on our chest at one thing or another, they'll ask what that means. I, Nick, you have a story recently, right? Where someone, or you have two, two different things you'll tell people. It's like how, how, what kind of mood you're in. Yeah, but yeah. we'll skip over that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, because sometimes if uh, it's like some people know the date and they'll think you're uh, we're a religious organization, uh, so it ends up being this long conversation. But uh, but numbers are, seem to mem mesmerize. I, there's just something about them where people always are kind of curious, like, oh, what does that mean? And also to answer, you know, part of like the catalyst of why 1517 started was um, because we just saw some amazing outcomes after the five years happened. And in fact, during year two, um, Michael and I have shared an office for at least eight years at this point. Um, so at that point, we were two years in, he turns his chair to me um, and he says, hey, you know, since we're having trouble getting investors to take Teal Fellow seriously, you know, we'd ask, can you look at a pitch deck? Will you take a meeting? It was really tough. We were thinking about, or Michael specifically, was thinking about building like an investor base within the fellowship, like maybe some angels, things like that. And I remember Michael telling me, he's like, we should really start a fund. And I sort of gave him my like, what are you talking about, Willis face? And uh, <laughs> like, what? No. Uh, and I said, you know, one, we don't know what the outcomes of these young people would be. And two, we don't know anything about investing. Why would we do that? Uh, Michael is a far smarter man than I, most importantly, because he's a man and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a bad joke. Just go with it. <laughs> no, he's brilliant. Um, and when I should have listened, this is what I then. have to put up with all the time. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, this is prime fifteen seventeen. Um, but uh, but yeah, I should have listened then because five years later we saw some outcomes of young people. Um, OYO Rooms, which is a, a company based in India, which at the time um, I think they were worth. Uh, about uh, half a billion at the time. We had another, um, we had a couple other startups who were similarly tracked. Um, and, and that was, you know, the, the numbers and the data that we needed. And so we took that to Peter and we said, hey, like we've got companies that are really going here and we could be making investments in these companies and the program could be, you know, it's on rails. It can be running itself at this point from an operational standpoint. And, and that's what really like, pushed us to say, hey, we're going to go out on our, on our own and do this. Uh, we, uh, that, that was the pitch, and it was amazing to me, just as I mentioned before, the different types of investors we met who were interested in our story. We had, uh, you know, we met an oil man from Texas who, uh, who, who basically, I, you know, I, he's from a very prominent family, and he, and he just said, I don't know much about deals, but I like, no, no, I don't know much about technology, but I like making deals. And I'm in, so like that was that. And then we, uh, and then we met the the family behind Hot Pockets, you know, the 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 food everyone who smokes marijuana loves, and uh, and 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 yet they had like four Harvard MBAs or something who were all uh, finance guys, and and they're asking us for quantitative risk models and very sophisticated analysis. Um, we had this funny moment where uh, we had so many meetings in our schedule. Uh, we lost track of, w of of who we were meeting with that day, and uh, and we thought we were entering the hot pockets office, and we're sitting down and we're talking to this this investor, and the guy is just like t telling us like Jerry wants this and Jerry expects that, and I'm thinking who's Jerry, and uh, and then it dawns on me, and Danielle before the meeting she's like, what if we sang the hot pockets theme from the commercial like hot pockets. <laughs> And then we're in this meeting, and it dawns on me, we're not in the Hot Pockets meeting. This is Jerry Yang, the founder of Yahoo's office. And how weird would that have been if we sang the Hot Pockets theme? <laughs> they didn't invest. <laughs> so who are um, 
some of the the founders and companies you've met that have, have really blown your mind. I know in the in the invitation that many of you um, saw, uh, we talked a little bit about Luminar and Austin Russell. That's a fantastic story um, that I think everyone would would love to hear some more about. Um, and then. Second question to wrap into that is, okay, so that's the first three years of 1517. Um, you're moving into fund two now. Um, what lessons have you learned in fund one that, that you're starting to incorporate into your plans for fund two? Yeah, lots to cover there. Um, let's see, to talk about, yeah, talk about some of the founders first. So we'll talk about Austin Russell from Luminar Technologies. Uh, they're based in both San Francisco and Orlando, Florida. We met Austin when he was about 17 years old. Um, he was a applicant to the Teal Fellowship and he had come to an event that we had um, with mom in tow. Um, and we got to know the family over a long period of time and he was a physics geek and very interested in uh, optics and photonics. And you know, we just, we had, we started developing our own pattern recognition for who are the types of people that we think have that chance to be someone who does really extraordinary things. And one of the things that we look at um, is like a deep curiosity. People who are really insatiably curious, oftentimes even in our pitch meetings, we'll ask people about their hobbies and what do they like to do outside of, you know, other things because we, we want to know what they're learning about. Or we'll ask like, hey, what's a fun fact you've learned recently? Um, it's quite telling just to see how deep people will go, uh, and not just in their companies, but in other things. And then um, another thing that we look for uh, are actually like the social graces to be able to build a team, to do sales, to work with other people. So that intersection of people who are bright enough to work on a really deep technology and also have the social savvy to like build a team is it, it like that Venn diagram there it gets pretty thin, so that's another thing. Uh, and one of the things that we look at, um, which is something that we sort of talk about, and I don't know if coining the phrase is quite right, but is hyperfluency. So we look for people who can really talk about the tech and their industry just backwards and forwards, real clear, real clean. Think about it, like, you know, I, I took four years of Spanish in school. I am terrible at it. I have no fluency. You know what it sounds like when someone is stumbling their way through something versus when someone is fluent in it, they can just move really gracefully. So we look for that kind of articulation in the people we work with. And again, that, that's going to be a small group of people. But Austin had that at a young age. He could really talk about different physics concepts and his passions in this particular way. And so we brought him into the Teal Fellowship. He incubated um, multiple ideas that he was working on, all his phys physics projects. None of them were like a, a company per se. We always said at the uh, foundation that someone could be doing a startup, a nonprofit, or just a project. Like who knows where it's going to go. So he incubated there for two years with the $100,000 grant. Um, he started hitting on some ideas in LiDAR technology, which is... Um, you know, basically like using using uh, lasers to be able to identify the field in front of you. Um, and when he was getting started in that autonomous driving was starting to be kind of whispered about. And so he started getting into that space. There are other spaces as well where this is apl uh, applicable, um, like in special effects and camera, movie industry, things like that. But he, um, you know, he started working on this technology on his own. Um, he built a team of five people, most of whom are very close to him. Um, some of them are family members with him. Um, others are people, you know, who are um, like very old time like mentors of him as well, who have a lot of expertise in the industry uh, or working in industry in general. And so when we started 1517, um, part of our pitch then was, hey, this guy Austin's building an incredible technology. We really need to be able to, you know, get the capital to be able to to put into, um, you know, his company Luminar that he's building, and that was five people. Then I remember seeing a demo in a garage. The tech actually looks totally different than it does today. Um, they demoed. Um, they were showcasing how fast the speed was of getting the laser to a point and back in a hallway. Um, so like not a super high, high tech demo, if you will, but, um, but to fast forward a bit, um, we invested in his company. We were the first institutional investors. Uh, he now has a 300 person company. And we went to Orlando to visit their manufacturing facility that they set up. 
And I was just speechless the whole time. Like to, to go back to the word humble that we've said here before, I was completely humbled. I was like, I have nothing to say. Like this, and y'all have heard me talk and I can just talk and talk and talk and talk. So um, th that's not normal for me. But it was amazing to go in and see like, oh, like there's uh, like the, the first um, outside of the garage they had, they also worked out of a house. Um, and so it was very casual. And so to go into this facility in Orlando and there's a reception area and there's literature about Luminar and there's a UPS guy dropping off packages and there's people who you can tell have children and mortgages and car payments and like there's real people who this company is supporting. It's not just the crazy founding team anymore. It was just so awe-inspiring. And, and just to feel so struck by, wow, like we were able to help with like capital and mentorship uh, and be a trusted advisor to this team and to just see it taking off. They have a public partnership with Toyota. Um, they have a whole bunch of different deals in the works. But it, it's just been a completely eye-opening and inspiring experience. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> oh. Well, I, I think... I mean, that's a, a, a good segue into the next question that I had because, um, you know, with Austin, you met him at 17 years old. Um, you met him through a Teal Summit. Or back then we were calling them under 20 summits. And you kept in touch with him. The, the thing he was working on initially when he, he applied for a Teal Fellowship is not at all um, what Luminar eventually was or became. Um, and I think that's very reminiscent, um, or very relevant, rather, um, to conversations that are happening here locally to what we've been talking about here with, um, with the Farnsworth Fund, um, and specifically in talking about the importance of community um, for entrepreneurs and for young entrepreneurs. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really interesting about uh, your work over the years, both with the TL Fellowship and now with uh, 1517, is that you have such a um, a strong focus on community. Um, you describe community as a, as a force multiplier for everything. Um, and that's uh, kind of, of um, not typical, really, of a venture fund. So can you talk a little bit more about um, what those community activities are? I know I'm, I'm asking you to explain my job. But, <laughs> but um, you know, why, why, is, um, why is community important? And what does that mean when you're saying um, you know, we, we focus on community because I feel like sometimes we have a tendency to um, uh, view community as this nebulous concept of something, eh, we should do that, we should focus on community, but it's kind of nebulous because it's often hard to quantify. Um, but I think that quantification comes with time. If you have patience, you begin to see those seeds start to sprout and, and grow into trees, as we've seen with uh, someone like Austin, who we met through a community activity, and now he's uh, working on a business that's, that's um, you know, in the, the billion-dollar ballpark um, valuation-wise. So can you talk a little bit more about um, what that, that community activity looks like? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess one thought that was coming to mind is, like, um, to me, community is our currency within 1517. Um, you are looking at the entire 1517 team up here, so we're very, very small. Um, and it's through other people and their willingness to help and support and want to be with each other that we're able to scale our work and do what we do. Um, so as an example, each quarter we have a social and actually, when our socials first started, we just told people it's good people and there's good food. Come hang out. Um, we're in San Francisco. People started driving up all the way from San Diego County. It's an eight hour drive to come to our events because they wanted to be with other young people who were building things um, and other people who got it and be in a room of people where the first question wasn't always, where did you go to college or what school are you at or what are you studying? Um, so we've just always found it to be a benefit. I mean, we really started doing a lot of community building when we were at the Teal Foundation. When we started the Teal Fellowship, I still, like, gosh, one of my favorite memories is when we had our first finalist round for the Teal Fellowship in 2011. We invited the top 40 people to come out and meet each other. And um, I just remember, I think it's a Hyatt uh, at the uh, Embarcadero Center. Um, all these young people, and it's funny, like, it was it was a it was very um 
symbiotic relationship where I think, you know, we had a lot of uh, goodwill that we were building with applicants. I mean, you know, Nick talks about being rejected, but I, I think we were pretty, like, nice in the way we would try to do that and how we would phrase it. It wasn't like, you're a bad person, you're terrible. It's like, hey, it's just not a fit right now, like, which is a very different message. Um, so when people came to the finalist round, I still remember this guy, Brom, who's hilarious. He, a uh, young man, um, was in that finalist group. He was gathering people in the lobby of the hotel and meeting and greeting them. He was not on staff. He's just a finalist there. And we would go down and say hi, and they would go off and grab pizza together. And we really learned from that first finalist group of like how hungry people were, especially young people, to just be with each other and be able to talk and have those experiences. Because even on their own campuses, it was so hard for them to find other people who shared their same views and really understood them the way that other younger makers and entrepreneurs did. Um, from seeing that finalist round, we thought, hmm, there's probably more than 40 people who want to hang out with each other. Um, and so then we started looking at you know, the, the top quarter of our applicants and inviting them to events. And what we saw over time was just ROI doesn't come after, um, you know, we would have these weekend events once, uh, twice a year actually. The ROI doesn't come at the end of the weekend. The ROI comes four months to a year later. And so like one of those ROIs was like we met Nick at one of our events that we had. And Nick being like just like the energizer bunny that he is started like sort of volunteering with us and getting involved. And we had a Facebook page. I think we had a Facebook page and he was on it all the time. And um, we we're like, huh, wow, this guy's like really active. Like maybe, maybe we can like tap into that energy some more and build more resources. And we saw different um, people we'd follow up months later and they'd say, oh, I met this person at the Teal Summit and now we're working on a company together. Or we'd meet mentors of ours who said, oh, I met this young person at the summit and now she's on our team and we hired her. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. It's really hard to capture this data, but we're hearing these great stories and narrative. And so we took that with us into 1517. Um, and so yeah, even at the Teal Summits we had, when we would get up on stage and, and present to two or 400 people who were there, we would always say, we are here friends first. We're a fist bumper hugger group. We're not a handshake, here's the business card group. Um, and so we worked really hard. I, I do think community is engineered. It's not just like, oh, lucky, look, we happen to get a good one. Um, it's something that you work hard at and you have to be thoughtful about. And then it yields these great results where people want to help um, in our group that we have now, people want to be hired by the people within the group. They want to work with each other. When we're going through due diligence with companies and we don't know about the tech, which is often the case because we're not deep technical people, um, we'll go to our community and say, like, hey, who knows about this technology? Who can help us source this? And, hey, yeah, I can help. I can do this. And I'm like, wow, this is great. Um, so it's just really a way that, that we, it's a force multiplier. It's, it's how we do so much more than what we could normally do. Absolutely. Um, so I, I do want to get to um, Q&A from the audience, and I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, Mike, did you? Nothing to add there. OK. Yeah. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, we've given you a whirlwind tour of, of Fort Wayne, um, starting promptly at about 7 AM today and still going. Um, <laughs> and we're trying to pack in as much as we could. Um, uh, but I, I want to get some of, of your um, your thoughts on what you've seen today um, on um, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, you know, we, we started today with a, a great breakfast down at Atrium and start Fort Wayne. You had a chance to tour that and meet some cool people. We went over to Sweetwater. Um, John Hopkins gave us a tour there. You rode the slide. You had good food. <laughs> um, we went to DeBrand and had good, uh, good chocolates. Uh, Mark Michael um, gave us a, a great tour of Fort Wayne Metals this afternoon. Um, and then you've, you've been down at a, a design week, um, and you and Marilyn had a great panel. So you, you've gotten a taste of Fort Wayne. There's much more of it out there. But um, I guess in the, those 24 hours, um, what's been really interesting to you about Fort Wayne? And, and as you visited all of these other ecosystems and, and interacted with um, other ecosystems all across the country, what advice would you have to us as a region as we try to support our entrepreneurs here? I mean, uh, I, yeah, just really impressed. Uh, I love, I mean, everyone was so kind. Uh, they took us into their businesses, gave us tours, explained things. I had my mind blown at least five times. Um, 
the uh, I love the the van at the lobby of Sweetwater because it's just such a great reminder that uh, such you know tremendous things can start in, in the most unlikeliest of places. Um, you know, I think if you think about how regions compete or what their strengths are, uh, it used to be, you know, there, maybe 10 years ago, Silicon Valley really was the place you'd want to start a tech company if you, if you had the idea. Um, and the reason that was the case was uh, that you had these powerful networks. You had investors who were willing to write checks. You had know-how uh, because they probably had started their own companies a generation before. And then, uh, and then you had a lot of talent as well. Um, fast forward to the present, I think, uh, I think it's questionable whether you should actually be there. Um, the, uh, the cost of living is extraordinarily high. Uh, the, they, they have outlawed the building of anything, any new apartments. So <laughs> with more and more people coming in, the rents keep getting higher. Uh, if you're a startup, you have to raise more money to be able to pay engineers to live in those apartments. Uh, so really these uh, rent, the people who own the buildings are, are the ones collecting the venture capital. Uh, it's not. It's not a healthy situation. And so when I when I tour uh, Fort Wayne, the first thing I see is this really strong competitive advantage that it is a, a very affordable, pleasant, nice place with great people, and <laughs> and uh, and and I'm sure <laughs> compared to, to San Francisco, uh, much much cheaper. And so and so what do you need is like know how. Well, a lot of it's like it's clearly in the community. Uh, I saw a handful of incredible companies today, and then when it comes down to how to start a company, all this stuff has been uh, written up in books. There's a lot of canned material now and videos, and 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 it's just easier and easier to get started. So it's like all the other regions or anywhere else uh, loses that advantage. Um, you know, maybe maybe you don't have as many investors, but over time, I think as people start to do things, that could change. Maybe you could draw bring in capital from from elsewhere in this region. We love the Midwest. We travel uh, uh, all across. We call it just the freshwater region because uh, we go up to Canada a little bit uh, on the other side too. And uh, it's just we we think it's overlooked because there's so many talented people here. So I don't. Know, I, I I come away today very impressed, and and I think you guys have what it takes. You just need to take the time. Uh, I know you're kind enough to pay it forward to everyone. So <laughs> I think it's just about maybe setting the intention and following through. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll largely sort of ditto uh, what Michael said. I was super impressed uh, with all the different places today that we went. Um, Sweetwater was a lot of fun. I will never buy gu guitar strings anywhere else. Um, it was really awesome to go over to Fort Wayne Metal. Um, we went to the chocolate group, and I still can't remember the name. I keep wanting to call them De Beers, and I'm like, it's not that, it's De Brands. I'm like, I must have something else on the brain. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was great to see all the different companies and the ecosystems and, um, you know, the, the co-working space. Um, like Michael, I'm just really surprised, actually, that there's not more here already because there's so much going on where you have the expertise of the people, you have the people who have come before, you have the, the Farnsworth history, like, it's all here. Like, as far as I'm concerned, it is all ready to go. Um, if I were gonna add, like, you know, what could do I think could help, like, we've talked about community a lot, so, like, having community events about people who are, you know, I actually like to, shy away from sometimes the word entrepreneur because there's a lot of people who will box themselves out of going to something because they're not a founder yet. Um, I even had a conversation with a young man a couple of weeks ago who was a founder. His company failed. He works with another startup and he was so embarrassed that he thought, oh, I can't show up at entrepreneurial events anymore because now I'm only working at a company that has 60 people at it. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a bummer. Actually, both of these two were in the room for that one and that would have made a great podcast episode, but I <laughs> didn't get to do that. It was a very like inspiring mentorship moment for me. Um, but um, but yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of ecosystem here, and building that community and ta talking about you know maybe having like maker events, like people who love love to to build and think about moving things forward. Maybe people who like to think about business. Um, they don't have to be entrepreneurs. They don't have to be founders to get that started. I do think capital is important for uh, for all different regions. Um, so I'm really happy to see Farnsworth get off the ground. Um, I've loved the you know the grant part of the program that we do. Um, it is you, it's you have to be patient money. 
with that because it takes time. We couldn't have known when we met Vitalik or Austin that it would take multiple years for them to get to a point where we'd say, wow, that is really working out. Like there's still ups and downs, but the trajectory is definitely there. Um, you know, so I would say like stay the course on these types of programs, like really commit to a few years at a minimum. Um, there were many times at the Teal Foundation when we probably were considering like, oh, should we throw in the towel? We don't know. How's this program going? Is this actually good for the people we're working with? We're not sure. Um, but we stayed the course uh, and that program is still going. And so I you know, love to see those ecosystems built here. Um, but I also think that there could be higher amounts of capital that people come together and do. I was talking to Marilyn a little bit earlier that there are some angel investors in town who do it here and there as sort of a one-off thing. I think it would be great if uh, if Fort Wayne started like angel investing groups where maybe once a month that group comes together and you know hears different pitches from people in the community. Ideally, there's a relationship built from that community effort where you've seen people at events and you hear them and yes, they come in for a formal pitch, but that's not the first time you're seeing them face to face. And from there, you know, maybe they're able to get anywhere from a 30 to 50K check from a group to keep doing what they're doing. Because I do think that having tiered capital is really helpful to get people get started. So that might be like one piece of advice is, you know, to maybe formalize certain aspects that are happening here informally a little bit more. But yeah, I'm just surprised there's not more here already. But I'm excited to come back next year and see what's going on. Well, and we'll hold you to that coming back next year. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want to do a, a few questions from the audience, and then uh, Danielle and Michael will be hanging around, um, so you'll have plenty of time to chat with them um, in between. But um, with that, who's got a question? Eric, let's go. And let me hand you the mic. Could you talk a little bit about the microgrant process? You know, on the one end of the spectrum, it would seem there's throwing darts in a dark room and hoping that a few of them hit the target. At the other end, it's how do we build better models and better filters to find those high potential people that have that special something that's going to build a successful company. How, how does your process work and kind of where do you fall on that spectrum? Yeah, great question. Um, and if so, I can follow up, maybe yeah. sharing the Mac story oh, would yeah. be a good one. Absolutely. Okay, trying to figure out, like time-wise, I'm like, that's a story. All right, I'll give the mic to Mike then, because I'll be like, oh, I'll make it a long story. Uh, when we originally conceived the idea, we, it was, uh, we thought, you know, maybe, because uh, we were giving out, a hundred back at the Teal Foundation, we were giving out $100,000 grants. We thought, what if we did something really small? Uh, so we just set up a table at one of the community events, it's basically a pitch table. Uh, we had a, a whole bunch of people line up, and, uh, and and we didn't know what to expect. We had one young man sit down. He was 18, and uh, we said, "Okay, what do you want to do?" And, and and he didn't even actually he he didn't even want to to pitch us. He was scared because uh, I don't know. He I compared himself to other people, frightened uh, his mind, and uh, someone had to encourage him to do it. And so he sits down. And we say, okay, what, what do you want to do? And he says, well, I want to disintermediate freight shipping brokers. And I'm thinking, you're 18. How did that sentence just come out of your mouth? <laughs> it's like, well, what do you know about freight shipping brokers? And he says, oh, I started an ice cream company when I was 13. And then I started importing cups, cones, and wrappers from China. And I had to deal with all these middlemen, and they're operating by phone and paper. We're like, okay, here's a thousand bucks. Fast forward. Uh, uh, so he wanted to create this platform where they could get rid of that middleman with the paper and the pencils. And, uh, and, and like three months later, he contacts Danielle. He says, uh, I'm, this is actually the same conference that years earlier Peter had launched the fellowship in. And uh, he, he had made it to the, the, to the final round of this pitch competition for TechCrunch Disrupt. There were investors in the audience. They heard his idea. They ended up uh, investing $500,000. He just uh, he just raised his Series A uh, this last uh, round of financing led by Lufthansa, the airline. So he's moved. He has uh, freight shipping, and now he's doing airline shipping. He's based in Portland. He has something like 30 employees. Uh, so really extraordinary story for us. That in the first 10, th 10 grants we gave that time, one of them blossomed into this company. Uh, original. What we were thinking is. Uh, you know, it was always, uh, I guess with younger people, what we thought was a lot of them are doing a lot of things to get in the college. 
you know, it came back to that where uh, the college admissions committee really def sets the incentives on behavior K through 12. So you have students taking vacations and doing conspicuous acts of philanthropy that they hate just because they think they got to stand out in an application pool. And we, we thought, how can we get people to do things that they just really care about and they can fail doing? Because, you, I mean, and like maybe in the college application essay, you get to say, oh, I tried this and it failed and I really learned a lesson. Uh, but beyond that, you can't really fail. You get a bad grade, it's a tattoo. Uh, so we wanted the pe people to take risks. I uh, th thought a thousand bucks would do it, and and so the ideas kind of felt that fit that mold. Where is this something that's kind of weird, and and we want to support? It was usually in the idea phase, and then there was usually some kind of itemized list that added up to a thousand bucks of what they needed. So it's like, hey, I need to buy X, Y, and Z. It's going to be like eight hundred bucks. Uh, that that's more or less the ideal situation. And then once they have a prototype, maybe they can. Uh, they can try to sell it or get a pilot, uh, something of that nature, pr like a, a proof point. It doesn't always fit that. Sometimes we just meet great people, uh, and, and, and they're just building something wacky. This one guy wanted to build it like a drone with a balloon attached to it, and it was just, that, he had that drawing. It was beautiful and crazy. Uh, we supported that. If, if we could, there's something also about the surprise we found where, uh, if we were in a place and, and, and if we could just give a, an envelope with a thousand bucks in cash, that would be even better because then it's like, you know, getting a tap on a shoulder from the CIA. It's like, hey, you get, here you go, uh, go do this crazy thing. Um, and, and the reason that's the case is, 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 is often, uh, if it's unexpected, then, then it seems to, to, the validation even matters more. It's like, wow, you think I should do that? And, it, and maybe that helps that we're from uh, San Francisco and we come to some place like Fort Wayne and, and then we give out a grant and, and it feels like, wow, someone else outside of, of this town thinks I should be working on that. So for your own grant program, uh, you know, it will be different in some respects. But, uh, but I think maybe that initial framework I was thinking about where it, there's clear there's an itemized list to get to some kind of prototype where maybe you can prove out, uh, you can validate something in the market with a customer, something like that. Another question, Mike? So I sit on the Urban Enterprise Association board here in town. We've been tasked by the state to spend a million dollars a year developing an entrepreneurial ecosystem, whether that means funding things that are already doing well organically or identifying gaps and putting things in place. One of the struggles we've had as a board is metrics, because traditional metrics, economic development, it's jobs, jobs, and jobs. And obviously, this is a different, I view it as a portfolio, you know, this is a different model, and what we've been trying to do is identify metrics. What have you done from a metric standpoint? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough challenge because the metrics often do come sort of far later. Um, I'm trying to think like both from the Teal Fellowship side um, plus on the fund side what we would think about in those areas. I mean, we, we did certainly think about hires, like how many people were brought on board. Um, you know, oftentimes for metrics, people want um, quantitative, they don't want qualitative, um, which I think is often a shame because there's a, there's a lot of good stuff in, in qualitative narrative, um, but it's also really hard to understand where that's going over time in the earliest phases. Um, so we would also look at like, how much money did this person raise? We'd also look at like, how are they doing with keeping their mentoring relationships? Are they keeping their commitments to what they're doing? Um, you know, how many connections are they making? We used to count things like that. Um, I'm trying to think on the 15, 17 side. I mean, one of the things that we look for a lot, and I don't know exactly what you would call this on a metric, but is really proactivity. And so with our grant program, we don't say, oh, like we do say like, you know, we want to hear from you once a month until uh, it's time to take either the next step with us or until like maybe the project peters out, which is totally fine. We think of our grants as a learning opportunity for us in many areas, uh, not only with people but with technologies. Um, and um, sorry, I was going somewhere. My the train went that way. <laughs> the other wave went that way. Um, oh, one of the things though that we think about with that grant program is that um, we're not there to turn those people into entrepreneurs. We're there to guide them through something if they want it and if they're hungry, and that hunger has to be through reaching out to us. We can't be reaching out to them all the time, tap, 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 hey, are you gonna send us your monthly update? Hey, are you gonna show us the thing? Like, 
that those like saying having to manage someone is not what you do with a founder like it's just not how it goes um so that might be something to look at from a metric standpoint is like um you know how many how many times are people reaching back into the program to ask for advice or help that also tells you how your program's doing because if people aren't reaching out to you maybe you're not being that helpful and you need to build in better cycles for things um so those are a couple ideas that come to mind. Um, I mean, we always also got qualitative information back um, from TL Fellows. We had a survey we would do every year. Um, you know, we'd ask people what they'd want to change, what they loved, um, what was most impactful for them. So we, we would collect those as well. And um, we don't do a survey with the companies we uh, work with now or our grantees or mentees, but we do, we have a lot of printed pieces of paper from emails of like, you guys changed my life, ah, and we put them all over our wall, um, you know, so that qualitative stuff like keeps us going, but um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tough challenge. I don't know if anything in addition. I th yeah, it's really, uh, just to re-emphasize, is like, the, I think the metrics are really hard to measure on that. Um, on the investor side, we uh, we focus on things like how valuable the companies are because that's how we make money. Um, we 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 di we're not uh, a social impact fund, but uh, we want to be proud of the things we invest in, and, and hopefully they change everyone's lives for the better. I do think jobs created is very hard, especially with technology, because uh, sometimes uh, you know you're doing more with less. Um, but but I think what I would pay attention to is the number of companies started uh, and, and, and try to figure out how your allocations are related to that, uh, the qualitative feedback. One, one wonderful thing Danielle does that uh, makes our, our office actually kind of uh, unique is uh, any we, we receive a lot of letters from people we've worked with and have supported. And they're very kind and, and uh, grateful letters. And, and we put them all up on the wall. And so it's, a, it's just a reminder of, of the influence we've had on, on their lives. And that helps us keep it in mind. But, but we, we, we ourselves don't have a metric where it's like, you know, how are we benefiting a specific region? So that, 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 I think that's really hard. I'm going to add one more piece to this, which is that actually I think sometimes, depending on how those metrics are collected from, from the, uh, the recipient, um, I think can actually have negative consequences. And so we'll talk with some of our companies about their other investors that they work with. Um, and they'll say, yeah, they want you know numbers of hires we have now, what's our burn rate, um, how much revenue, how many uh, you know monthly active users we have. The problem with this, with super early stuff, is that you get what you measure. So you might have someone who has more employees, but it doesn't mean they're building anything good in the long run. Um, and so our purview is that you need to allow people um, the freedom to be able to change things very quickly, sometimes very drastically. Um, one of our companies was a, a, an app company that turned into a, a hardware company. Huge pivot. They actually didn't even tell us they made the pivot until we had a review with them. We brought Nick there. And it was this whole story, but we walked in and there's bubble wrap, like as big as my arms, boxes everywhere. And I was like, guys, you're becoming a computer company? Yeah, that's what we're doing. And I'm like, wow, okay, cool, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> um, but, um, but they're doing extraordinarily well now. And I think had, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what that particular company's other investors were like, but had we been super hard on them, like, we need these numbers, you have to make these metrics, blah, 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 they wouldn't have had the freedom to make that change. And so I actually think that for, like, early investors and people who are working at the most nascent stages, um, it's good to have an idea of where you want people to go, but if those metrics are just getting artificial results, like, oh, we brought in another intern, it's like, okay, great, but is it really going to make it in the next five years? Like, I don't know. So I, I'm just kind of wary of, like, like we would, um, we talk about these things in reviews with companies, but it's not, um, it's never, like, dangled like a, like a punishment or a reward, like, oh. You didn't make your numbers. We're not going to send you as many services this month. Like it's just never going to happen like that. Great points. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. All the way in the back. Hi, I'm Rasamin. Um, I'm 26 and I'm a millennial. And uh, I think one thing 
is that the struggle of being a millennial is people trusting you mm -hmm. to follow through or they say, oh, you guys are, you know, you jump from one thing to the next and, or something. And then to top it all off, I am um, of color. <laughs> and so that has another added factor into the trust thing that, I, you know, I went through the college thing and I did it and it was great, but so I guess my question is, what would be some advice to keep on going and to continue and not give up? Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, first, uh, I'm sorry that you're handling struggles of trust, um, like people, people thinking, like just blanketing on anything because of one's uh, age, gender, or race. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think for us, we have such a belief in people and when they come to us, um, you know, we know that they're showing like blood, sweat and tears on where they've been going. Um, and it has been hard for a lot of the people though, you know, we often are times the first investors who, who will go in on something will, will lead, um, lead a deal in that arena. And I think that will help sometimes for people to sort of build up like, um, just outcomes that they can show to other investors. Oh, hey, 15, 17 invested in me and so on. Um, but I think, um, I guess the advice that I would at least give is just that like, you know yourself. Like you know that like, if you're on something for you know, the foreseeable future or not, you know, um, you know if you're gonna like, just move in a certain direction and execute. One thing I would say is to be honest about that. I mean, I've certainly, we've had a number of teams, one of the mistakes that people will make is that they'll over promise and under deliver. Um, and it's tough because we'll tell people like, hey, we'd rather you, you know, not like set the bar low because we don't want anyone to do that, but like be really real with yourself and be really real with us because that's the only way that we can really work together. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think for you, like it's really important to build up a community of other people around you who you can like check in with, even peers. I know I have a lot of friends in the startup world who every Monday will have a, a, a stand-up meeting at a coffee shop or even over the phone if they're remote. Hey, what are you doing this week? Like, what are your challenges? How can we help each other? And just getting those yes people behind you, and I know they're few and far between, it's really, really difficult, but, but those are the people you want to cultivate around you because they're going to help push you forward and keep your spirit positive so yeah just to re-emphasize what Danielle was saying is uh, we've had like you, you you just prove them wrong and you can do that by telling them what your goals are and then just hitting them uh, we, we uh, whenever we're evaluating anyone in a, in a deal it's never like Shark Tank where someone comes in and and just wows us with a Don Draper pitch. It's, uh, it's actually the case that we know them over time. We've seen them hit milestones long before we invest. And, and the reason we do that is uh, because we're looking for things like grit and perseverance and the ability to execute. And, and then other things like social intelligence, how do they f you know, work with customers and uh, employees. And so I think you can, like the trust I think you're talking about is, is, is about expectations and, and, and how you meet them. And we've lost trust with people. I had a falling out with a founder because uh, he kept coming in and, and he'd give some, uh, like he, he'd tell us what his goals were for the next two months to the quarter. And then, uh, you know, it happens four times in a row where he's, he, he, he's missed them. And I, and I lost trust in him in the sense of, and it came out in, in my language, which I guess I could have communicated better, but he'd tell us what his goals were. And then at that point, we'd say, okay, I'd say, okay, we'll see. And so he was, he was actually upset because he, he says, all you say now is we'll see. And <laughs> I said, well, you don't, you know, you keep missing your goals. And I, I don't know. So it's like the, the trust had broken down because uh, I think the expectations were too high. So I think you can prove people wrong. I mean, maybe if you're looking for investment, that's going to be hard, but. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Is that is that uh, what we love is even if we're not investing, send an email weekly, monthly, just saying, giving an update. Hey, I you know I got three more customers. Uh, they said they like this feature. We're doubling down on it. Whatever. And and then that stuff adds up over time. And and they then they there's no way they could say, oh, you're a millennial. You don't you don't stick to things because the the proof is right there. 
just as an interesting counterpoint, um, I noticed a lot of our stories tonight uh, have, have focused around he, so I want to bring up a she story. Um, and also 30% of our founders are uh, female and people of color. Um, and uh, and actually, I have to even look. I don't even, th I, I have to look. Like Maybe we have a couple teams, but we have very few teams that fit that stereotype of like, oh, it's only white people that you know uh, investors fund. Um, so I'm really proud of that. But um, one of the people that we funded is named Maddie Maxey. Um, she's in fashion tech, and we've known her, I think, t since 2014, something like that. 2013, okay, even earlier. Um, she actually started out with a blazer company. She made blazers out of recycled materials. We met her through the Teal Summit Group. Um, we have seen her um, just jump through very large hurdles, both professionally and personally. We just know she has so much grit and perseverance. And she came to us two years ago with her company, uh, which is called Lumia, and what they do is uh, she came up with a novel circuitry that's embedded in fabrics so that you can do electronics in fabrics but without wires in it. And she came to us, she was solo founder, and you know, she said, I'm getting this company started. We wrote her, uh, I think it was a $200,000 check at the time, some of our other investors also looked at the deal and just thought we were crazy. They were like, whoa, solo founder. She doesn't have very much in terms of traction. Like, why are you even making this bet? Um, so they were sort of not believing in us and what we do. And we said, no, no, you don't understand. You don't know Maddie. You don't know all the things that she's been through. And we've seen her just jump massive hurdles. She's building novel technology. Like, we just absolutely love working with her. Um, and now she has a company that is a, is a team of five people. Um, they are actually uh, integrating their sensor into blockchain technologies as well. Um, she has an extremely diverse team. She's just off to the races. And it was from really knowing and seeing how she worked over time um, and seeing that work and that effort um, that, that made us so confident at the earliest stages when other people wouldn't do it. So um, to everyone else like listening, like be supportive, like find out like, hey, how can I help you on what you're doing instead of doubting people right away because they're young, because maybe um, you don't think they can do what they do. Like ask them like, hmm, how can I help? Um, and you'll see, do they take the coaching? Do they make the connection? You know, do they get on the phone with the person that you connected them to? What's their follow through? Like, you'll learn that really quickly, but you won't learn anything if the door is shut. So keep that door open. All right. Well, we are at 9.35, so we're going to wrap up. Um, so thank you, um, Danielle and Mike, for making the trip all the way out to Fort Wayne. Can we have a round of applause for them? Thank you.